got this uh, stove here. Now, a couple things I want to talk about right away is that, uh, you know, I keep looking at that cleaning issue. I said I was going to do cleaning. Watching me clean a stove is probably, I don't know, it just seems to me like a lot like watching paint dry. But that just didn't interest me all that much to really show you that. You can clean them. I'll tell you how I cleaned this one. I, I didn't, you know, polish it, obviously. I just tried to clean most of the dirt off. You can still see there's some lacquer, cro I mean, you know, some fuel lacquer here. Oh, what are you going to do? You know, well, this would come off with some solvent action. Um, all I've done is I took a brass bristled brush. Now, this is real brass. This is not brass plated steel wire. Don't do that. But get yourself a real brass bristled brush and just gently use a solvent. You could use mineral spirits, lacquer thinner, white gas. If you do any of those things, you're completely on your own. You take your own risks. You should use gloves. You should use uh, breathing apparatus. You should use uh, adequate ventilation to make sure you're not, you know, having a problem there. But anyway, a lot of the crud will come off like that. You can also soak these in soapy water overnight. Some people like to add a few um, citric acid crystals. What I've done with these parts at this point is I've cleaned them up good enough for us to put the stove back together. And uh, I'm going to just call it good because I didn't really want to knock the patino off the stove anyway. I just wanted to show you how to take it apart and put it back together. Next thing. So there's that's the cleaning. Sorry. There's some other videos on, on YouTube you could look at on how to clean and polish. Uh, there's a guy, some Colorado camper guy, does a real nice job on his video of showing how he polishes his stove up with some, he's using like semi-chrome or, or one of those little polishing compounds. Now I've looked at this, I'm changing subjects now, we're back to putting the stove back together. I've looked at this wick and I decided it's kind of, so I, I'm not going to reuse this wick. I'm going to say, eh, so much for the wick. I'm going to show you how to make a wick instead. What I have here is a roll of stainless steel wire I bought. This is actually a uh, you know, 0.032 wire. It could probably stand to be a little thinner yet, but that's what I got. Eh, it's soft stainless steel. It's pretty workable. Here is a cotton mop head. If you've never seen one of these, this is what it looks like. Here, let me bring that up a little bit. All right, this is a cotton mop head. It's like what janitors use, or, you know, anybody that has old-style mop around their house uses. You can buy one of these for, like, four bucks or something like that. They aren't very expensive. They're designed to be, like, throw away after you get them all dirty. Get one of these if you want to make a wick, get one of these, and you cut a strand off of it like this. And then you want to unravel the individual strands on the thing and you just kind of uh, just carefully unravel them. There you go. And you'll get these single single strands like that. You have the single strands. And you get them all off there. All right, all right. So that's how you do that. Here I've already done one. Now to make a wick, I take about three of those strands. And what I do is I double them over. Here's my three strands. And I double them over like that. Now, obviously, we're going to have a lot to trim here. I'm doubling them over. We're going to have a lot to trim. And that's okay. Now I'm going to take my wire. I've got this stainless piece of stainless steel wire I already cut. And I'm just going to put that right in the middle of our strands like that. And I'm just going to kind of get a little bit of a start on twisting the wire like so. And I'll take a couple of pair of pliers here. Hold the end. And then use the other end to twist from. Like so. Uh-huh. Nice tight twist here, like so. Mm. Concentrating there, so 
so concentrating. He can't talk at the same time. He's concentrating so much. All right. You don't need a lot of wire sticking out. In fact, let's use our old one as an example. Basically, the wire forms a nice handle to insert the wire into the vaporizer with. All right, so we really... About what I got there. Well, how about that? Like, maybe I know what I'm doing, huh? Okay. Let's just trim there. And here. And just, uh... Finish that end there so it looks a little nicer. Ah. Uh huh. Like that. And you got a nice end on there. Okay? So that's what that's looking like. Now we turn it around. How long should the wick be? Well, you know, just make it about the same length as the other one that you already had. Not hard. Just go like do 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 do. Oh, that looks about good. There you go. Mm-hmm. And we'll just take our scissors and my very dull scissors. <laughs> And there you go. You got yourself a brand new wick. Okay? Every, everything's good there. To insert the wick, you kind of want to just put that wire embedded in there. This is what I do. Put that wire embedded in there. How much wick do you want to put in? Ah, how much of your wick do you want to put in the hole? All right. No, about that much. <laughs> okay, there it is. It's in there. Got our wick. Everything's hunky dory. That's how you do a wick. All right. Next step. Well, the next step would be to insert this in the tank. And we're going to take a quick break while I go drink some more coffee. And uh, then we'll be back and uh, finish that up. Okay. So, we got our wick. All ready to go. Hey, I got my little cup of coffee. Mmm, it's a little espresso. Mmm. Mmm. Mm. All right. Next step. We want to insert our vaporizer and its wick back into the stove. Sorry, you're over here. <laughs> there we go. All right. How to get that in there? Well, that's a tough one. Something rounded, like a Phillips screwdriver nose, works good, and you can just kind of feed it in with that. Just get that wick down in there, huh? Getting that, or you know what really works good, and I like this better. I usually use this. It's just have this little paintbrush. It fits in here good. It's nice and rounded. It's got paint on it. You know the the handle is painted, so it's kind of slick and won't hurt anything. Just stuff that guy down in there. There we go. Putting the wick into the stove. Ah, yes. All right. Getting it in there. Almost in. When you get down to the very end here, get down to the very end, you can see it's still, it's like there's a little bit, it'll just pop in. There you go. All right. Next thing. I like to put some sort of thread sealant on the threads of my vaporizer. Is it required? Well, no. Technically, no. It shouldn't be. These are actually a tapered thread. They're a strange tapered thread that conforms to no known standards. Sorry about that for those of you who want to duplicate it somehow. It's very bizarre. Unless you know how to cut tapered threads on a small lathe, you're kind of stuck. You're not going to be able to make this thread. Uh, it's a proprietary thread from Svea. As many of these stoves had proprietary, that means like they made them and no one else made them and they're not anything standard kind of threads. That's what we got going here. And these threads, because they're tapered, uh, the more they go in, the more they tighten up and eventually it forms a gas and liquid tight seal. Is it necessary then to put sealant on? No, it's not necessary. What's nice is to use a graphite or other anti-seize thread sealant lubricant 
because it makes it easier to assemble the stove, it also makes it easier to disassemble the stove later on. So that's what I like to do. Here's one type. This is an expensive, I'm not even going to show it to you because I can't get the lid open, expensive graphite paste that a fine stovey let me have or sold to me or something. Uh, I use that sometimes. I've been using, lately I've just been using this stuff. This is uh, anti-seize lubricant for threads. It, it takes uh, temperatures up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit and it's under $10 at Napa, as I recall. Napa is a auto parts place here in uh, the U.S. It's a Permatex product, but I'm sure wherever you live, if you went to an automotive place, you could find something similar that would do the trick for you. Um, hang on. All right. I have a little brush that I use for just this purpose because it's kind of gooey stuff. And here it is. Ewy gooey. And I usually just pull this applicator out and get a little on my brush. Hopefully you're seeing this. Yeah, okay. There we go. And then I carefully just put a little bit on the threads, right at the bottom of the threads, like that. Yeah, okay. I'm going to put that back in there, put this back away over here out of sight. Cap this guy off. Now, carefully, without cross-threading, there you go, and I find to avoid cross-threading, you know, you kind of wiggle it back and forth while you're applying pressure and the thread should seat. And then there you go. Okay. Now, you can see that this is that mark that I put on here earlier. There we go. This is that mark I put on here earlier and I've got a ways to go. Now, believe it or not, it's not only going to go to that mark, but it's going to go probably around again. It'll be snug at this mark. Yeah. Yep. That's what that's what gives me the clue. Is it gets snug at that mark. But that's not snug enough. Even with the anti seize lubricant, I can get a whole nother rotation out of this stove to make sure I get it seated correctly. There we go. Lining up correctly. <laughs> with my mark. There it is. Lined up with my mark, which in my case is about the back of the A. So everything's good. Now you're thinking, well, what a moron. How's he ever going to get that stupid line off of there? I happen to have this old wick. I bet it's still got some white gas in it. Oh, look at that! Yeah. What mark? <laughs> okay, so that's how I do that. Next step. Let's get this guy back in here. Now, remember I said I was going to reuse the graphite packing, and I am. So I'm going to put the spindle in here and spin it in. until it's seated. Oh, hey, you know what? I've got to show you something else, too. I'm sorry. There's some discussion about this going on right now. Take a look at this nose on your spindle. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. But you can see there's like a little bright spot. That little bright spot is where it's actually seating. Now, if there's burrs, little shreds of metal, or it's torn up or anything, take yourself some 400 grit sandpaper and gently polish that. You can maybe try steel wool. I don't think that'll do it. But 400 grit, wet dry, that's the black stuff. Here, you have a piece right here. <laughs> yeah, like this stuff. This is cut up. It comes in big sheets. But polish that up a little bit and then take some 600 and really make a nice polish. But you don't want to have burrs there. All right, so that's going to sit in a hole. That little thing I was just showing you it goes into a hole and it blocks the fuel uh, fuel flow, and that's what it's all about. Now this time it went in very nicely. I actually tried this earlier and had a problem, and what I had ready was this brass tube, you see. You can get these at hobby stores. 
And if you're having a problem getting that graphite to get in there past the threads and seat so you can get the um, spindle nut on, you can take one of these and just kind of push in. See, it goes over the spindle, but you can push in, get that graphite seated in there enough that then you can get the spindle nut on. Now, you could put thread um, lubricant on the spindle nut if you like. I tend not to. It doesn't seem to be real necessary. It's going to all seal up with the graphite anyway, and I've never had one of these seize up yet, so, you know, until I do, I guess I'll just follow along my old stupid habits. Okay, so we're going to set this down in here now. Now, how tight to tighten this? Well, I tighten it nice and snug, but not so snug that the spindle won't turn. Here's what's going to happen when we start the stove up later. We'll probably have a little bit of leakage around this, and I will actually tighten it up while the stove is operating until that, that leakage stops. You'll see me do that. Okay, can this still turn? Yeah, it's, it's a little snuggish, but it will loosen up as, as we fire up the stove the first time. What's next? Well, we could put the fuel cap on if, if that makes you happy. We'll take it off here in a little while. But there you go. Oh, fuel cap. Woo. All right, next step. Really, seriously, next step. This is our cleaning needle. It's got those teeth on it. It's got a needle at the end that goes up through the jet. These are strictly um, kind of a gimmick for this stove. It's nice to have it, but before they did this, they had little... Uh, little slips of metal with a wire in it called a pricker and you just manually prick it and that worked fine too. If you like having more mechanical stuff in your stove then put this back in. If you don't and you leave it out and try to resell it well then you'll lose value so I guess it's worth putting it back in. Ideally um, get yourself the earlier model of these instead of having the straight spindle it'll have an angled spindle and they don't have a cleaning needle, and they work just as well. In fact, I think better. But that's my little editorial thing about these stuff. So take it or leave it. All right, so we've got our spindle cranked all the way down. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this pencil with an eraser. You've been wondering what that pencil was for. And we're going to actually insert that needle that's on our um, cleaning needle and rack. This is the rack part with the teeth. How do we orient this? Well, if you take a look, you'll see that the spindle is actually on one side of the vaporizer tube. It's on this side, okay? You want to insert this so that the teeth are facing that side because that's where the teeth on the spindle are. So we're going to slide this in here. <laughs> we're going to put this in here with the teeth going that way. And we're going to set it all the way down, and we're going to apply a firm pressure. Now, just because my hand shakes doesn't mean I'm not, I'm really working that hard. This hand just shakes, you know. That's the way it is. You get old. Sometimes these things happen. It's not an alcohol thing. Trust me. <laughs> it's not alcohol or drugs. It's just breakdown of my poor old body. So here we go. We're going to open this up and we're going to listen for clicks. Listen, listen. Here we go. Opening up. There's one click. There's two clicks. There's three clicks. I'm going to go for four clicks because I'm a four click kind of guy. And there's four clicks. Now when you get to four clicks, go ahead and just crank the spindle close. Hmm. You know what? I think that my first click was a crummy click. I'm going to do a, a fifth click. How many clicks should you do from three to five? generally speaking. All right, here we go. We're going to go for a fifth click. There it is, fifth click. All right, now I'm going to set that back down in there. That looks better to me. We won't know for sure until we actually fire up the stove. Okay, so we'll find that out here in a little bit. You can see, hopefully, you can see the needle is set down in there. All right. Three to five clicks is what you want to use. It's a little bit trial and error. If you don't get it right the first time, there's two things that can happen. One, your stove won't burn very good because the needle's up in the, in the jet. That's not good. Two, the other thing that can happen 
by the way, I'm putting the jet in. I just spun it in here with my fingers and I'm going to go ahead and use this tool just because we have it handy. Even though I do like the other ones better. Tighten it gently. The thing about the clicks is that if you don't, if you have it down too deep, the needle down too deep in into the vaporizer, what will happen is that the stove will um, not be able to be turned off. And in that case, you kind of have to just blow the flame out. And once the flame, you're sure it's gone, you can then release the pressure from by undoing the cap slightly. And then disassemble, take the, the burner belt back off, and reset the needle. Try that until you get it right. You can get it right. All right, we're going to put this, this uh, um, key back on. How do I do that? Well, I drink the rest of my coffee first. Mm. Mm. And then I'm going to just take my toothless pliers, straighten it out a little bit, put it on here, and use my other toothless pliers, these big ones, with a nice slip joint on them. And just go ahead and crimp that around the vaporizer where it came from. Now, of course, being toothless, they want to slip a lot, but it means also that it, it doesn't damage the wire and end up with big <laughs> plier tooth marks on it. Okay, so there it is. That's not coming off. That's good. Our stove is now assembled. So I'm going to go ahead and fuel the stove up, and then we'll fire it up and see how it does. Okay. Okay, welcome back. Here we go. We've got uh, the stove... I've been sitting here letting it kind of soak up all the fuel into the wick. It's fueled and I'm just letting it settle a little bit. The idea being that uh, it's a dry stove, dry wick before I put the fuel in it. The wick takes a little while for the capillary action to move up into the section that we put inside the vaporizer. We don't want to fire that dry, it'll just scorch the wick and then it won't conduct as well. Um, I'm just doing this. I don't think it does any good to do that, but there you are. Makes it look like I'm doing something. So, let's fire it up and see how well I did on placing that uh, cleaning needle. Frankly, I think the cleaning needle is a little high yet, so I may have to redo this, but we'll find out. So I filled a little depression at the base of the vaporizer tube. You see I actually spilled a little over the edge. Oops, sorry about that things happen. And I have my handy dandy 10 millimeter wrench ready so that when and if, and I think it probably will, when and if this spindle nut leaks a little I can just go ahead and keep cranking it closed. You can do it with your tool. The thing I like about this is it gets my fingers a lot farther away from anything that's hot. <laughs> but go ahead and, and if that should leak then we'll go ahead and, and crank that closed until the leak actually stops. Now I used, this is denatured alcohol in this red uh, wash bottle. Uh, denatured alcohol is available through any paint supply place, Home Depot, you know, it's basically the same kind of alcohol you would drink if you were to buy straight alcohol like Everclear except they put poison in it so you can't drink it, don't drink it. And um, that way they can sell it for pennies instead of high prices like the kind of alcohol you drink. Because you didn't know the way that works. That's, that's the way it works. So, but you can get that and it burns really good. Just, you know, it's kind of imagine if you're having baked Alaska somewhere or something, a fancy dessert alongside the table. Like I've ever done that, but I've seen it in movies. All right, so we um, have everything ready to go here. The flame has gone out. I'm gonna put my key on here. Open it up slightly, I hear a hiss, and I light my stove, and hey, look at that, we've got some flameage.
Yeah, I think the needle is a little high still. But it's not too bad. We're getting we're getting some flameage and it's actually pretty good blue flame. I wonder if you guys can just zoom in here. Oh yeah, there you go. Oh look. Bernie Dog's got blue flame. And you can see it's pretty weak. You can hear it too. It's pretty weak right now. That's because it's still heating up. Now the hotter these get, the more pressure forms inside the tank. Uh, the heat, you know, makes what air is in there expand, and that creates more pressure on the fuel. And uh, that squirts more fuel out, makes more heat, and it's like a cycle. That's one of the reasons there's a safety cap, is that we don't want that cycle to go uncontrolled. But there we go, we've got our stove up and running. If we were to come back here in a minute or two, it, it would probably be really rocking. Maybe I should do that. But you can see, I'm going to show you why I think the needle is a little too high. If I open this much more, you know, see how the flame goes away? That's because the needle's starting to get into my jet. I don't want that. So I close it down again. I'm getting a pretty good flame there. But look, it goes down pretty fast. There's not a lot of adjustability in that. So if I had it down another notch, I'd have a little more adjustability. But it's not too bad the way it is. So, suffice it to say, if you were doing this yourself, you would maybe go ahead and extinguish your stove now, let it cool completely, and then reset your needle maybe one more notch down, one more click down. And then you'd be in good shape. Back off here with the old camera. Sorry about the bounciness. That's our stove. So that's basically it. Notice I don't keep the key on the stove. Simple reason, this will get as hot as the stove. You grab this later. If you left that there, grab it, you burn your thumb. That'd be bad. So that's basically it. That's how to reassemble your stove, get it burning, how to put in a new wick, how to sort of clean it up a little bit, and certainly how to disassemble it. It was in the other video. So see that on disassembly. Pretty simple stove, pretty nice little stove. I hope if you attempt to do this, you're safe. Um, don't do it if you're clumsy. That's my disclaimer. If you, you know, if you're a clumsy guy, maybe you don't want to do this. Maybe you get somebody to do it for you, okay? Um, not everybody's cut out to do this. Uh, if you're mechanical, hey, it's it's a walk in the park. It's real fun. You get yourself a nice stove. Everything's great. That's the deal. Thanks for watching. I hope this helped some of you who are interested in how to reassemble a stove.